Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this press conference from the 47th annual meeting of the World Economic Forum here in snowy Davos. Welcome to everybody here in the room, and also welcome to all of you on the live stream, and of course, a special welcome to everybody here on the panel. Um, for those of you here in the room, if you made your way um, through the snow, um, it is uh, probably hard to believe uh, that water is a scarce resource. It is, however, and uh, that's what we're uh, dedicating this press conference to today. The question is access to safe water, and we have a wonderful uh, panel of experts and people who have dedicated their life to work on that uh, issue of access to water. Um, let me quickly introduce um, our panelists to you. Uh, to my immediate left uh, is uh, Dominic Worry, who's the head of public-private partnership at the World Economic Forum, and is also leading our work on climate change and water. Um, further down the line, we are joined uh, by, by Gary White, who's the co-founder and chief executive of, of, uh, officer of water.org. Right uh, in the center of our uh, panel, we're joined uh, by Matt Damon, who's also a co-founder of water.org. Um, on his immediate left, we're joined by Ricardo Tadeo, who's the Sound President Africa of Anheuser Busch InBev. Um, and last but definitely not least, <laughs> we're joined by Usha Rao Munari, who's the Chief Executive Officer of the Global Water Development Partners and a longtime champion of water issues also uh, at the forum and on its platform. So thank you very much for being here today. Um, Dominic, uh, give us a sense of why water is an issue that the forum uh, feels uh, uh, deeply about and, uh, and why we're putting this at the center of attention here in Davos. Thank you, Jörg. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, we ran some analysis uh, with our colleague Usha Ramanari and some of you um, in the audience uh, several years ago um, that when you look at an economy, it's a thirsty thing. Energy, food, industrialization, urbanization, these are thirsty businesses. Um, and in fact, it's so thirsty that by 2030, if we don't change the way that we use the water, the fresh water that we have on this planet, there'll be a 40% gap, 4-0, 40% gap between the water that is safely available to grow those economies and what we have. So that's a choke point, plain and simple. Uh, we are profligate with water. We don't use it wisely. Over 70% of the water we use is for agriculture. There are huge efficiency gains to be made. Energy is a very thirsty business, whether it's fossil fuel energy or others. So if you add all this up together and we have a fast-growing global economy, particularly um, across emerging economies, something needs to change. That is why in our risk report for the past seven years, and you'll see it in the global risk report for 2017, water remains one of the top global risks that the World Economic Forum and its network of risk analysts identifies. Now, the trouble about water, or the intriguing thing about water, is it's all joined up. So in fact, that risk network is exacerbated by climate change. Climate change might create um, more scarcity of water because it's warmer, or it might change weather patterns. It will dump water all at once. So climate change and water become a double risk. And of course, if you're a farmer or you're poor and you are susceptible to risk and there's no water um, and the climate is warming, you might move. Water, climate, and migration, involuntary migration, are the three top global risks of the World Economic Forum's risk report for 2017. All of that against a baseline of a world where there are over 7 billion smartphones but 2.2 billion people don't have access to an adequate toilet. Something is not right, and something needs to change to improve the economic productivity and inclusive growth of our economy. That is why the World Economic Forum is very interested in water as an issue. Thank you, Dominic. Uh, Gary, um, you've obviously realized uh, the, the issue early on and, and founded water.org. What is at the heart of the foundation, and, and, and how do you see the risk? Um, are you optimistic or are you pessimistic? Well, I, I am optimistic uh, for a few different reasons. I think when we look at, you know, whywater.org, it's, it's a slice of this global water context. And what we try to do is come at it from the perspective of people living in poverty. So there are these macro issues, and they need to be addressed from the top down. And I think that there are things happening to make that, make that work out. But for us, it's like, what are those impediments to the poor? 
getting access to, to water and sanitation. And we want to have them have a level playing field so that when resources are developed, when infrastructure is expanded from the top down, they uh, have a level playing field and can come into uh, getting these water and sanitation solutions. And I'm optimistic because if you, some of the work that we've done on the, the Global Agenda Council for Water has focused on these coping costs. The coping costs of people buying bottled water, even very poor people sometimes having to do that, paying water vendors, uh, the health costs, the, most, the direct health costs in terms of going to the doctor, buying medicines, but the lost time. You add up all these coping costs, and it's, it's, it's about $670 billion, according to our preliminary results on this. We need to do a little bit more refinement. But uh, those are all funds that are in the system right now that could be redirected. And what we've done is help people from the bottom up through water credit get access to microfinance so that they can get away from some of these coping <coughs> costs, not pay loan sharks for funds, and then use those uh, micro loans to get improved water and sanitation. So I think that's really what we see. We see the, the problem itself contains, the problem contains its own solution in terms of the resources being there to make this happen. And I think just in wrapping up, uh, one of the dominant themes that's emerging here certainly is income inequality. And I can't think of any greater manifestation of income inequality than people not having the money to gain access to water and sanitation. That juxtaposition of what we so much take for granted at the turn of a tap that 663 million of us, or 2.2 billion uh, from the sanitation perspective, don't have this basic commodity. And that's how income inequality really hits home for the majority of the world's poor. Thank you, Gary. Matt, uh, let's continue with you. you uh, I imagine you have a pretty tight schedule normally. So I, I hear from Xi Jinping this morning that you just came back from defending the Chinese uh, wall. So, um, <laughs> so what's... Uh, why did you throw your weight behind water? Was it uh, beyond Gary's charm? So what was it that convinced <laughs> you to, to work in that water field and dedicate so much time to it? Well, I was just looking at issues of extreme poverty, and I was just so impressed by how water and sanitation underpinned absolutely everything. And, uh, and nobody was talking about it. It was something in the West that we have a really hard time relating to. Um, and so as I dug deeper and deeper, I, I eventually came to the, <clears throat> I'm trying to do this as, f as fast as I can because I know we're under, but I eventually came to the realization that I needed to partner with the, the best expert I could find in the sector and, um, and when they wouldn't take my calls, I ended up with Gary. <laughs> um, but uh, but I should, what I should do is just another minute on water credit. Gary kind of breezed over it, but um, it, it, it's, uh, it's an innovation that, that, that uh, came from Gary um, through his time uh, in these, uh, through his whole adult life kind of interacting with these communities, he basically realized that the extremely poor of the world were paying for water. Um, you know, they weren't, they were oftentimes paying ten times more than the middle class of, of, of their country, but the, the concept of water credit was essentially applying the ideas of microfinance to the water sector. And so the kind of thought leap that that required for these microfinance institutions was that Normally, they give loans that are, you know, income-generating loans. You give me $200, um, you know, and uh, you loan me $200, I buy a sewing machine and start a sewing business, and I pay back your $200. What Gary realized was people were leaving jobs, women primarily, were leaving jobs to go stand in a line and collect water at a, at a communal collection point. And it was this terribly inefficient use of their time. And so if you actually fronted them the money to connect to the existing infrastructure in, say, an, an urban slum in India, where, where water's being piped right, right under their feet, they're just not connected to it, what you could essentially do is buy their time back. And so rather than wait at this communal collection point, they now have water coming directly into their house and they can work more hours at their job and pay the loan off with relative ease. And so it was really, uh, it seems like a simple thing, but it was a pretty profound insight. And so we, we started piloting this and it's worked really better than we ever could have hoped. I mean, these loans pay back at n over 99%, 93% of our borrowers are women. 
and, and it's something that, that really can scale and is sustainable also because as these loans come back, they go out again. And so the philanthropic cost of capital per person just goes down every single time that loan gets recycled. Um, so r right now we're down in our most mature loan programs to under $5 per person uh, to get them, uh, to, to get somebody clean water. So, um, so it's, it's been a really effective uh, tool of ours and we've been looking for these special corporate partnerships to kind of turbocharge our work and that's one of the reasons uh, we're here today to make an announcement. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Matt. And it's good to see you, uh, whereas Dominic pointed out that the risks are connected. You're also saying there, there's also positive spillover effects into other areas. So that's, that's great to hear. Ricardo, uh, Matt mentioned the, the, the corporate partnership. Um, and uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about what, uh, uh, what you're doing with water.org and why you've chosen to do so? It's very important to mention first that we believe that every brand needs a cause. Right, something really to stand for, um, to stay behind it. And for Cell Artois, which is one of the most iconic brands, beer brands in the world, where water is its most basic ingredient, it was just natural that water became that cause. And I think that our situation was more or less like Matt's situation. I mean, we start studying the problem. We got into the situation when we saw that one out of 10 people in the world don't have access to water. And it actually was a surprise. I mean, I think awareness is something very important to drive awareness to that situation. Um, and then I think the idea was Stellar Artois could inspire people to help solving that problem. Because the other important thing to mention is that this is a solvable problem. This is not something that, I mean, we'll, it's one of these world problems that will be there, there forever. We can make a difference. The companies can make a difference, the consumers can make a difference, and what Stellar Artois is doing is trying to be a bridge for that happening. And uh, we are announcing here today the extension. We, we've been working together since 2015. So, I mean, we have helped Stellar Artois and its consumers has, have helped uh, more than 800,000 people have lifetime access uh, to water. And now we are expanding uh, for more four years. We have this goal to get to 3.5 million people mm -hmm. until 2020. So it's a very important day for us. We're here. We thank a lot, uh, Matt, for, for the pre being, being here today with us. And uh, we are very proud. I mean, we are launching a new line of chalices uh, that can be purchased. I mean, the first year we sold about 90,000 chalices worldwide. Second year, 135%. This year, we are aiming for more than 300,000 chalices. Every year, a different set of chalices. We have chalices that are made by artists from Brazil, Cambodia, Uganda. Very nice products. So, I mean, we believe we're doing something big. We started in a relevant way, but still small. We are almost three times now the size we were at the beginning. And we can only think where can we get if five years from now and if we get more companies, more brands mm -hmm. getting behind the same cause, which is something that we are inviting everyone to take part of it. Thank you, Ricardo. And Usha, I know you're, you're modest, but Dominic, uh, he, uh, he snitched on you and he told me that you actually have uh, been behind many partnerships and you have a lot of experience w with these concepts of, of collaboration. Uh, why don't you share with us kind of what's the impact and, and what makes that work? Thank you, Georg. Um, absolutely. I think partnerships are what is needed in the water sector. If you take a step back in water, right, and you look over the last century, it's a shocking statistic, but water use increased three times faster almost than population growth. That has resulted in the kind of statistic that Dominic quoted, where looking forward, by 2030, you're going to have a 40% de deficit between demand and supply. That is a serious situation because water, as Gary and Matt have, have, have explained, is important for life, it's important for dignity, but it's also important for economic growth and corporate operations. And that's a fact that has escaped people, that you know, it, water is necessary for the power sector, it's necessary for you, Ricardo, it's necessary for everybody, but somehow people have taken it for granted, assumed that it is infinite. Today, we're unfortunately facing a situation where accessible water is not infinite. And so we have to look at water as an economic <coughs> good in addition to being a fundamental life-giving good. 
I think partnerships are important in the water sector because they've never had them in the past. The kind of stuff you guys are doing, bringing the corporate sector in alongside possibly governments and financiers like me, is what is going to make that difference in the water sector and create the tipping point to avoid a 40% deficit future. Thank you, Usha. Um, we have some uh, time for, for questions. So uh, please, uh, we have a microphone on two sides of the room. If I get a uh, show of hands to get a sense of who has questions. We have a gentleman here in the front and the lady in the back. So if you could state your name and organization for the sake of our online audience, please. Yeah, hi, I'm Harry Strail from Swiss Television. Um, you teach people, uh, sorry, my question is to Matt. Yeah. I'm surprised. <laughs> <laughs> You teach people about your project also in a in a humor way, in a humoristic way. Um, is it important for you not you know not to be showing the moral pointing finger? Well, that's, thank you for that question. Uh, <coughs> we've we've struggled with messaging in general. We've tried a lot of different things. We tried, you know, uh, humor, as you say. You know, a few years ago, I went on a toilet strike for the entire year. Um, and you know, so we've really tried anything we can to get the message across. One of the one of the kind of first hurdles we have to clear in the West is is that it's it's just very hard for people to relate to this. Um, if you grew up in Europe, if you grew up in America, you you know, uh, you've never been thirsty in your entire life, and you've you've never been more than five meters away from a clean drink of water. Um, the water in our toilets is cleaner than the water that 663 million people have access to. So it, it's really a, it's a hard thing for us to <coughs> wrap our wrap our brains around. Whereas, if you're fundraising for, you know, an AIDS awareness or cancer prevention or things like this, you know, people can relate to that because they they have a family member or a friend who's been affected directly and um, or they've been affected directly. And so, um, so we've really struggled, I think, with our messaging. And it's one of the reasons we're really grateful to have this partnership with Stella. They, they've, they've, they've done some really innovative things. Like, for instance, not beyond the chalice sales, they've got this idea of in, in the UK or in America, if you walk into a bar and order a pint of Stella, you are going to provide somebody in the developing world with clean water for a month. Right? And so that's a very direct one-to-one -one co correlation, and that's not something that we, we ever would have thought of. So to be able to have their <clears throat> that apparatus and that relationship they have with their consumers and, uh, is really important to us, and we have really high hopes for, for where, where that might go. And then on the same side, you know, we've made this film that's gone up on the Internet today, and um, this digital uh, short following this one woman going on a water collection and kind of just explaining her one specific story and how her life has changed by gaining access to clean water and it's they're, they're just such good storytellers they're, they're and they've and they've done this uh, kind of th film that's less than three minutes that's a completely perfect kind of digestible story that really helps kind of uh, uh, show the way this this issue directly uh, affects affects the people that it affects so um, so our messaging, I think, is improving with the help of people and partnerships like this. Um, but we still have more to do, and we're, it's, it's constantly a give and take as we come to forums like this and interact with the press and, and, and talk to people. Um, you know, we're, 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 we're open to anybody's good ideas. Thank you very much. Let's take the second question from the lady there in the back. Thank you. Thank you, Florencia Angeles for W Radio Colombia. Matt Damon, thank you. Uh, how can we uh, explain all the interest in the, in the topics like economy, like uh, sustainability, like, uh, I don't know, migration, but the water is not only in all this agenda of leaderships. How can you convince the leadership to uh, the, uh, to some, something to do something, and also if you have uh, already uh, the compromises or the apportation uh, to your uh, foundation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's get the next next question. Uh, yes, please. Uh, well, I mean, I I think <coughs> I, I slightly disagree with your okay. premise. I mean, I think you know, as as Dominic pointed out, this has very much been on the agenda here for the last seven years, mm -hmm. um, and so I think. There is a rising understanding of uh, of that, and and look, that par par partly that that's what we do. We try to come to things like this, 
and convene you know, groups like this so that we can talk about it precisely so that we can raise awareness. But I mean, our work has been going better than we ever could have hoped in that, in that Gary's hypothesis about these, this uh, microfinance play and how, how, uh, how successful it could be was, was absolutely correct. And, and, and now we're just looking for ways to turbocharge that work. And, and, and I think this partnership is a great example of that. Let's hear from the other panelists. What, what else is missing uh, that, we, that we can add to do more, to raise more awareness? I, I was just going to say that, you know, I agree with Matt. I, you know, there is a lot of awareness on the part of leaders. I think uh, Dominic mentioned the Water Resources Group that the forum has backed um, and has sponsored over the last, what, four or five years. That has really brought the issue up to leaders. Today, we had a session earlier today where the prime ministers of various countries gathered to talk about how important water was as a development agenda issue for them. So I think it's getting up there alongside some of the other uh, more popular issues, yeah. Excuse me, could you use the microphone sorry. because our friends on the live stream will otherwise yes, not sorry, hear your question. The, the last, uh, when uh, can we uh, see the, the results of... Uh, uh, the results, when yeah, can you see results, the results? Yes. <coughs> um, well, uh, well, the aim for this particular partnership is three and a half million people by 2020. Um, but we've, you know, hopefully you're going to just see the results for in, in terms of water.org. It's, it's, it's ongoing. I mean, to date we've reached uh, 5.3 million people with these solutions. And so... Um, you know, when we were in India a few years ago, uh, we asked our microfinance partners to identify the, the biggest bottlenecks from their perspective, and what they all reported back to us uniformly was affordable access to capital. And so they felt like there was a massive demand, um, and we could be doing much more. So for us, it became ways to, we started troubleshooting. How do we deploy more loans? How, how, how do we get, get them the access that they need? And we came up with this idea of water equity, which was to try to tap social impact investors and, and, and start to build a fund, which we did. We did the first fund, which was $11 million, and we've deployed that. And now we're doing a second fund at 50, and we're trying to bring in big banks. We're trying to bring in high net worth individuals and, and people t and target a 3% return. Um, but, but, the, but the real impact of the investment will be, obviously, the, on the social side. Uh, can I add something? I also think that leaders are attracted for things that work Right, people want to see things that really work, and I think that the fact that we started at 15 with a yearly contract, uh, reaching uh, 800,000 people in two years, and now we are moving for a long-term commitment. Mm -hmm. I think that shows that we are doing something that's doing good for the brand. It's doing good for lots of people, and hopefully that example can be a model for many other brands, many other leaders to follow. And I, and I think, you know, we share the vision with Stella that we can be the generation that solves this water crisis. And we need to come up with, with new ways of thinking about it. This is really, I think, what the partnership has been built on is the innovation of water.org. So being the organization that innovated water equity as a new, as a new approach. Because we need to bring water to people today and we're doing that through the Stella partnership. But we also have to look over the horizon because we're, we're you know, realistic enough to know that even water credit isn't the solution for you know, the two and a half billion people without sanitation and the 663 million without water. We need new ways of thinking about this. So we're always looking over the horizon with water.org to figure out that next innovation. And that is what's gonna tie this back together with us being the generation that can end the water crisis, always looking at new partnerships, new ways of doing this. Uh, social impact investing, as Matt mentioned, is coming on so strong now, and we feel like we're positioned to drive a lot of investment capital to this because it's such a basic solution to a, such a basic problem, and it's bankable. Uh, we're providing a financial return as well as a huge uh, social return. And then to your point also about how do we bring in more people into this and how does we get more attention, we want to democratize that and create a platform this year that will allow anybody to come in and make a loan into water equity so that people can get uh, safe water in addition to the large-scale investors that have come in to this point for the first fund. You're, you're talking... Just yeah. a second. I think Dominic wants to, yeah. to add something. Oh, just, just to um, just to build on that. I mean, you are uh, welcome in here at the World Economic Forum in, in in Davos, and you know that this is a platform for public-private cooperation, and there's not a better topic <coughs> than water. 
that illustrates the power of that collaboration, as you just heard across the panel. You know, we have partnerships that will get us to over 500 different partners across multiple countries. You have government leaders who recognize the economic kind of weakness that poor water quality presents. And you have wonderful innovative partnerships with water.org uh, and companies and brands like Stella, as well as many other um, uh, companies and brands who are working on those, on those partnerships. So here at the forum, this is exactly the kind of platform where you can bring together the public and the private and the civil society organizations to drive that systemic change at scale. That's what we aim to do in these few days. Thank, Thank you. you. So the gentleman uh, in the back and then yeah. the two ladies here in the front. So yeah, my, name is, my name is Tobias Bosses from Swiss Television. You're talking about awareness, which increases on the leader for all these problems. But now we have a change perhaps in, uh, in the States. So Matt Damon, what do you personally think about the presidency of Donald Trump? And could it perhaps have some changes to um, environmental uh, aspects and things like that? Because the awareness of that one is not so high with him. I can imagine there's a big interest to hear that. It's a bit of an off-topic question, so uh, Matt, if I don't know if you... No, it's fine. I, um, <coughs> I, we don't know, really, what his relationship to foreign aid is. There was a slightly alarming article in the New York Times a couple days ago that uh, laid out kind of the, the, the type of questions that came from his transition team to the State Department in terms of aid to Africa um, that was a little worrisome. Um, but I, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know him. I've never met him personally. I, I don't... Uh, I don't know what his relationship is with the developing world. I don't know if he's been to the developing world. Um, no, I'm serious. I mean, his interest is in high-end hotels and golf courses, and that, that's his business interest takes him to first world places, I think. And so I don't know how much interest or uh, time he's really spent in the developing world engaging with these issues. And so I think you have to give him the benefit of the doubt. And, and um, you know, um, you know, at a certain point, our work isn't dependent on the political kind of, you know, wins, and, and, and we just have to keep doing the work that we're doing. And, you know, President Clinton said to us a few years ago, you know, as, as it was clear that our method was very successful, he said, just keep running your numbers up. Keep running your numbers up, because he was just pointing out that we just gain credibility with the, the more people that we're reaching. And so that's what we're here today to talk about, really, with this, this great partnership with Stella. Um, and in terms of what President-elect Trump's relationship is to foreign aid, I think we're going to have to wait and see. So uh, time you. for two more questions. Gunilla, please. Hi, my name. Hi, my name is Gunilla von Hall. I am a Swedish journalist, Svenska Dagbladet. My question is to Mr. Damon. Uh, I'd like you to explain to me what access to things like clean water and toilets will make for the economic and social development in poor countries, <coughs> and can you give me some concrete examples of sure. changes, concrete changes that your work has led to <coughs> in these countries? So the very first person that I ever went on a water collection with, this is 10 years ago, I was in rural Zambia, and um, this girl was about 14 years old, and we walked together. I was waiting for her when she came home from school, and we walked about a mile to this well that was about a mile from her home, and we collected water together. And I talked to her about, um, well, everything. We had quite a bit of time to talk. And, um, and when I got to the topic of what she was going to do with her life, um, you know, and would she continue to live in her village, um, she, she smiled and said, no, 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 I'm not going to live here. I'm going to move to the big city. I'm going to Lusaka, and I'm going to become a nurse. Um, and I just really connected with her because... I remembered being 14 and saying to Ben Affleck, we're going to move to the big city of New York and become actors. And <laughs> I remember what that feeling was and, and, and what that age was like in that kind of world of possibility that's out, laid out in front of you. And, um, and as I drove away, I, I was struck by the fact that had someone not had the foresight to sink this bore well a mile from her home, this girl would not be in school. She would be spending her entire day scavenging for water for her family. And she wouldn't be dreaming about moving to the big city and someday contributing to the economic engine of, of Zambia. In fact, she'd just be in this death spiral of poverty where she was scavenging for water and trying to survive from one day to the next. And so leaving aside the really ho horrible 
uh, you know, uh, you know, a horrifying um, death. You know, every 90 seconds a child dies because they lack access to clean water or sanitation. Leaving that giant issue aside, there's this whole other issue of what kind of life somebody can expect if they don't have access to water versus what kind of life they can expect if they do have access to clean water and sanitation. So, um, so I think when we think of, you know, 3.5 million people that we want to reach together, those are 3.5 million of those very stories um, because that's a story you see repeated over and over again. I remember we were in Haiti together probably five or six years ago and a little girl, um, I, I asked her, uh, you know, how this water system that had been put in her village was going to change her life. Um, it, it, she had been spending four hours a day collecting water and I said, is this going to give you more time to study? And she looked at me, she was 13 years old, and she looked at me and said, you know, I don't need more time to study. I'm the smartest girl in my class. <laughs> and the way she said it, I knew she was telling me the truth, you know. And so I said, well, well then what are you going to do, hotshot, with all this extra time? And she looked me right in the eyes and she said, I'm going to play. And it just, it, it really got to me because I, I had a 13-year-old at the time. And just this idea that she hadn't been afforded the, the childhood right to play because she'd been so busy scavenging for water and now this was going to give her that opportunity so there's you know so hopefully you know we're by 2020 we'll create th through Stella three and a half more million of those stories and that's that's a big deal for us yeah. thank you okay let's uh, take the last please a short question because we're already running over time Sure, uh, my name is Farah Bushwak. I work for France 24 just a really quick question an observation really when I saw Stella Artois with waters.org I thought it's greenwashing I was wondering why um, a company like yours who uses so much water, there's so much waste um, to make beer. So why did you get involved? And how, how far actually are you planning to be involved? And I'm sorry if uh, you think it's free. Please don't <laughs> suggest that companies should stop making beer. Just selfishly. <laughs> Please don't ever it's make Selfishness that just again <laughs> and <laughs> I think it's a great question. And uh, thanks for the question. Actually, water is a great part uh, in terms of our our footprint. We we take very good care of water. We have some very important global commitments. We've been decreasing the usage of water by 50% in the last five years. And we are in this process of exactly defining the new goals for the following years. Uh, especially, I mean, I'm in Africa. Uh, we use 3.4 liters of water for each liter of beer. We want to reduce by next year to 3.2, which is uh, already a very good progress. I think this is part of some other points that are being discussed here about all the companies trying to reduce uh, their water footprint. And I would say that it's not only in our facilities, but also in our clients, educating the people who, who work with, with beverages and beer to in restaurants and bars to make sure that they treat water very well. I mean, there's lots of learnings and, and educational panels and efforts that we do in that effort. So uh, this is something big for us. I mean, as you said, um, every time we build a new brewery, we have to make sure that we have access to, to excellent water. So that's exactly why we, have, we are here. And that's exactly why Stellar Twice is here. I think that uh, we have the power to dream, right? So. Uh, we are pretty confident that we are going to reach uh, to this 3.5 million of these great stories that we've, we've heard here today. I think they're quite inspiring. And I, I'm really very happy for being part of this, for representing a company that, that is part of this. And I mean, we talk about 600 million. Uh, we are aiming for 3.5 million in, in f three to four years. Perhaps we could double this if we could get more 50 companies, 100 companies doing the same things, for definitely we know that there are in many different categories brands that could be part of that effort, join forces with us, we could solve this problem, right? Uh, and, and that's what you're here for. We're not here just to, to be a drop in an ocean, but really a constant force and drive for, for changing this for good. Thank you, Ricardo, and thank you to all the panelists here today. Thank you for, for joining us. Go and write stories about this because it is important and uh, there is still awareness to be raised. There's still no more to be done. Thank you for being here and thank you for watching. Goodbye. Thank you. Thanks.